Hello students, this is Alan Boris speaking to you from my office at Kenai Peninsula College. Today's topic will be the Riverine Kachemak tradition, uh, continuing a set of lectures on the prehistory of the Cook Inlet area. This is a slide we've seen before. Uh, so the Riverine Kachemak tradition is this group here bounded uh, by uh, 1000 BC in this area to 1000 AD in this area. Uh, 2000 years the Riverine people occupied Cook Inlet and the significance that you should remember is this is the first archaeological evidence of salmon cultures, of an intensive salmon culture here in Cook Inlet. Uh, we don't know uh, why there were no salmon cultures before 1000 BC. It has to do with the distribution of salmon almost certainly. It's not because people couldn't figure out how to catch salmon, uh, but uh, either the salmon were not plentiful enough or other reasons. We don't know. One of the unsolved mysteries of um, the Cook Inlet area. And then they rather promptly disappear about 1000 AD and are displaced by the Denina. I have some thoughts uh, on that and uh, we'll cover those as we go through the class. The Riverine people are um, coexisted with the Marine people further to the south. Uh, they may be one group they may be a separate group. The um, terminology is a little confusing. Uh, when uh, first found, uh, Frederica de Laguna called all of the cultures the Kachemak tradition, and which of course extends over into Kodiak and other places as well. But in uh, subsequent work, it was apparent that there were at least two different adaptations. The marine adaptation, marine mammals, uh, located in marine estuaries and the riverine adaptation focusing on the rivers um, and permanent houses, uh, uh, sedentary people up and down the Kasilov, Susitna, Kenai rivers and other places in Cook Inlet. So Doug Rieger and I in an early report, uh, in fact here's the carbon dates from that report, yes, um, here's the riverine tradition here. Um, separated uh, and called this the marine Kachemak and this the riverine Kachemak to reflect that difference in adaptation. And that's the significance that you should uh, you should know. Uh, we kept the term Kachemak and maybe that was confusing, I don't know, uh, because the earlier publications had referred to the the cultures on the in the Kenai Kasilov Susitna area as Kachemak tradition. So we didn't want to wipe, wipe that out even though it's a bit of a contradiction in terms. Um, and maybe we should have just called it the Riverine tradition, I don't know. But that's the way it is and that's the way it stuck. So the dates are pretty clear from 1000 BC to 1000 AD and then this rather sharp break and the Denina appear. That will be a subsequent lecture. The uh, Frederica de Laguna found some of the first finds uh, in uh, 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 by her survey, the one we talked about or I talked about in an earlier class. Uh, and some of the first archaeological work was done in connection with these finds right here at a site on the Kenai River called the Merrill site. Homesteading uh, occurred, of course, uh, throughout South Central Alaska and uh, there was a homestead put in uh, near the Kenai River and some of the children of the families were playing in one of the road cuts and found this little uh, figurine, this face, this little uh, face right here. Uh, it's about two inches across I'd say carved of that clay stone that's common in the area and of course it caused a bit of a stir and, and might, rightly so showed it to their parents and showed it to a woman named May Sachansky who was also a homesteader. She and her husband Ed homesteaded in the area and uh, she was also interested in history and was developing a small um, local museum uh, initially called the Damon Museum and now has been moved and is part of the Soldatna Historical Society. 
that um, and it was on display. At the same time, a uh, man who grew up in this area, Doug Rieger, was working on his master's degree at the University of Alaska Fairbanks and uh, and was in anthropology and was interested, of course, from the area. And the, he began the first excavation at a uh, riverine Kachemak site at the Merrill site. And uh, the report is uh, still, of course, available and uh, contributed to our early understanding of this group. Another find in the same area, same site, was this stone lamp. Um, and it was, um, it was found uh, intact. Uh, what's interesting uh, for this lamp is that it's made of limestone. Almost all of the other lamps are, are pecked from granite, but this was shaped from limestone. Limestone does occur in very small pockets on the Kenai Peninsula. If you've, uh, if you're uh, ever uh, uh, fished at the Russian River area, they maybe know of the Russian River Trail, and that trail about a mile in goes through a limestone area, and that could very likely be the source of of this material for this lamp. Um, if not, it would have had to been traded in from a long distance away. So these are some of the earlier finds. Uh, and if we go back to this very early find, uh, we talked about this one, this remarkable stone lamp. This came from the mouth of the Kenai River. So it, too, would have been part of the riverine tradition uh, and uh, is part of this story. From a geographic standpoint, this is uh, proximate areas of cultures around 500 AD. Uh, this is the riverine area. The sites are in the Susitna area, river area, Kenai, Kasilov, Kustatan. They're in pockets around here. Uh, no sites other than right on the rivers. No sites in the upland areas. Um, no hunting camps. Um, uh, the, the sites are all village sites with large houses, five, six, eight houses, something like that. Um, at the same time, the marine Kachemak would be in this area, and uh, again, reflecting that different adaptation, marine mammals versus primarily salmon. And coincident, the Denina uh, likely territory was in their homeland area in the Lake Clark, Milchatna River area, but also extending further north into the Kuskokwim drainage in this area up here. And we'll talk about that when we talk about Denina origins and the movement from uh, st uh, stories talking about movement from the Kuskokwim area down into uh, Lake Clark area. So Riverine Kachemak will be in this area, and on almost certainly we have not found all the sites yet. There will be more, uh, more to find. These are some of the sites on the Kenai and Kasilov River. Uh, I'll talk uh, quite a bit about uh, this one right here, Kenai 147 and Kenai 043 here, because I was involved in those. I also worked at, uh, this is the Merrill site right here, Kenai 029, uh, and uh, uh, I've actually worked on a lot of these and been to all of them. Uh, so this gives you an idea of their distribution. Let's talk about the, um, uh, the Moose River site. So this is the Moose River as it flows into the Kenai River here and the Kenai River then makes this bend and goes on down. The site is uh, in this area here. This is Isaac Walton Wayside. It's a state park. I'll talk about it and show, show you pictures of it uh, because, and it's look, give its location because I know you'll be respectful of the site, but also it has protection because park rangers visit it all the time. Uh, we don't want uh, information to get out that would result in destruction and looting, which is both illegal and unethical. Uh, another site in this area, and it's very likely this whole area was um, part of this riverine Kachemak complex at one point in time. 
The uh, one thing I'd point out is that all the sites, and I'll develop this later as we talk, but all of the riverine sites seem to be at the end of a straight stretch of river because I will develop the concept or the idea that I think one of the primary uh, ways of fishing was drift net fishing in the river, drifting a net down, uh, targeting red salmon or sockeye salmon, and that's where the takeout point is because it's hard to take a net around a bend. And then they would process the fish there and focus on drifting nets right down this river. Um, they could easily have used same type nets in the Moose River as well. This is that earlier excavation, uh, 1975, a year earlier, that, uh, that what now is the Isaac Walton Wayside had been uh, transferred to the state. I believe the state bought it as a park and Doug Rieger and I went in and did some testing. We knew of these large shallow depressions that looked like houses on this little um, um, terrace above the river. There you can see the Kenai River in the background. And sure enough there were artifacts and so I put together this uh, early Kenai Peninsula College excavation uh, at the site here it shows it a little later this is the depression this is the house this is about 12 meters across it's a pretty big house um, and I forget the width eight meters or so and there's I can't remember now four five something like that uh, of these houses along this bench um, and that this excavation the next year 1976 was taken over by um, uh, was taken over by Greg Dixon and he worked there I think a couple of years. These are some of the artifacts um, in the upper left here are the notch stones, thousands of notch stones at a site like this, thousands of notch stones at most uh, riverine sites. These are chipstone in this area. Um, these, uh, the, these, uh, this material, this red material is a red chert uh, outcrops in Kachemak Bay and the other materials probably were traded in. Here in the lower left are slate artifacts um, at ground slate, uh, important material. And these are various, I don't know, knives or points in this area. Um, this material is, uh, this reddish color is, could be blood, I think it's blood. Uh, you can test for that now, you need money of course to do that, but uh, we used to clean artifacts quite nicely. Now we don't clean artifacts so nicely anymore because there's lots of residue material that you can pull off of artifacts that will uh, complete the story of their use. This is the excavation. Uh, this uh, is about a meter. Uh, this is the burned material from the house. This is inside the house. And this is uh, sand, river sand. This is the original deposit of the Kenai River. So they dug down into the sand, built the, built the house, and then gradually it filled in through, I guess, living. And uh, the artifacts would all be found within this area here. Here's a corner of the house. Uh, this would be the outside and then it drops down here. That's the inside of the house then. So this is inside. Uh, this being the boundary and here you can sort of detect the ridge at the end of it. So these are called semi-subterranean standard uh, technique of building houses in south central Alaska. Dig down into the ground and then build the house up from there. And this then being the original uh, deposit of the Kenai River. These are some of the timbers uh, that had fallen in either from the roof or it could be from the wall. It was hard to tell. Um, this uh, it was from here that we took some of the material for radiocarbon dates 
and the dates of, for this particular site all fell right around 400 AD and fitting within that 1000 BC to 1000 AD time span. So when you're dating material, of course, you're dating when the tree died, but we're making the assumption that there was a small lapse of time between when the tree died and when they used it to build the house. So this is a good indication of when the people occupied this particular house at the Moose River site. Uh, this is an important uh, uh, hearth um, uh, um, description. Uh, in the center uh, we, we found this ring of rocks um, with this sort of pea gravel in the middle. Uh, we were excavating uh, half of it. Uh, part of the reason to excavate half when you really don't know what you're going to be finding, and this has been the first hearth that was excavated, uh, is if you, you know, if you mess up on this side, you still have this side to recover. So we encountered and mapped these large rocks, and uh, I sort of thought that was the end of it. Um, but when we uh, took out the pea gravel, what was underlain with the uh, it was underlain by these large flat rocks. So the whole thing underlain by these flat rocks, and here the student is drawing the whole thing, and uh, we're capturing it in drawing form. Uh, this, as I recall, was toward the end of the excavation, uh, and I thought that was it. Uh, and so we took out the rocks, uh, of which are still stored here in the lab here at. Kenai Peninsula College and uh, surprisingly to me those rocks were underlain by these large sheets of birch bark and uh, so this would have been the initial sort of um, rock, uh, rock lining area and underlain by these sheets of birch bark and Doug Rieger has subsequently found a similar type of hearth style at uh, other uh, in, o in other houses although one I'll show you later uh, did not have this particular style. The function of the birch bark I'm, I'm, I think is almost certainly as waterproofing. Uh, when you in cold ground when you build a, a fire uh, of course it melts the top area but there's also a kind of uh, engineers call it pumping where the uh, water will tend to migrate toward the uh, porous areas and so I think the birch bark probably functioned to keep the um, to keep that water from sort of sucking into the hearth area as it probably did and then the large rocks in effect uh, function to protect the birch bark so this is a style when you find this style of hearth you know you're dealing with the riverine tradition Later we'll describe the Denina style hearth and the Denina houses. They're situated in different places but an entirely different style of hearth and so we can tell from the excavation whether you're dealing with a riverine style hearth which is this complex type hearth as described here or what it was a log crib filled with sand which is the Denina style hearth which we'll illustrate in the lecture on the Denina archaeology. This is another site. This is Nilnanqua site. Uh, this was excavated in 1978 by Doug Rieger and Bill Workman. And this is an aerial view of them uh, doing the work at, at that particular site. Um, so now I'd like to show you a more recent excavation in the year 2000, 2001 uh, at the Kenai River site. And so the site is going to be located right in this area here. And uh, this, by the way, is Kenai Peninsula College right here. And this is downtown Soldatna. Here's the Soldatna River Bridge. So uh, for those of you who know the area, that orients you. Um, and I'll show you some pictures of this grass flat. The straight stretch of river in this case is going to be this stretch of river and they would take out here and that's where the village uh, fishing a straight stretch of net fishing this is Slycock Creek coming in here and there's rapids and, ro and rocks and so on 
So they would have fished in this particular area and stopped here and the village would have been right here. This is a view of the site. This is that grass flats. Um, by the way, the last remaining grass flats of this type on the Kenai River. All the rest have been developed, dredged, whatever it might be. So this is a very important uh, area to maintain ecologically. And this, of course, the Kenai River and the site is in the woods up here in this area right here, also protected now. Kenai Peninsula College, by the way, is up on this bluff right here. My office is about there. And this is Slycock Creek down here. So this is the excavation. Here the technique was to bisect the house. You can kind of see the house here, this broad dish-shaped thing. Uh, and then we put a trench, one meter wide trench, through the middle of the house from outside to outside on the, on the other side. Uh, this is the excavation as we, without people in it, so you can see how it, uh, how we did it. Uh, if we had time, uh, it'd be nice to excavate the whole thing and someday maybe uh, we can go back and do that, or somebody will. Uh, to my knowledge, no entire house has ever been excavated. And we need to do that to get a better idea of the overall dimensions, the size, uh, lots of things we can then answer if we know the whole thing, the whole picture. So for now, we did this uh, bisection. Uh, this is what the site looks like. This is the excavation that I showed you right here where that red is. Make it redder right there. So this is just one house randomly selected out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, out of ten houses that exist at this, at this spot. A few asso uh, associated small conical pits. Um, and then these red marks are, uh, are excavations, one by one, two by two meter pits, something like that, outside of the uh, area, uh, testing to see what, what we could find. Here's that terrace. So this is this low marine terrace. Um, all of these are on a low terrace, marine uh, meander terrace, uh, very near the water. Just some photos of the excavation. Uh, this is a daily news photographer and you know taking notes. Uh, Sherry here taking say, copious notes in these type of excavations. Little rain, not too much. You know, do what we can. Uh, here we're you know just general views. Uh, some of you have probably been fortunate enough to be on archaeological excavations and. And if you haven't and want to, I hope you get the chance someday. It's, uh, I find it uh, very insightful. And more pictures. Um, this, uh, this, by the way, it's not a good picture of her, is Marge Mullen. Uh, Marge was in her late 80s at this site. Uh, one of the first to show up and one of the last to leave. And she uh, is noted because she and her family were the first homesteaders in Soldatna, Alaska. And she was absolutely privileged to work on this site. Uh, she has said, people have called me the first lady of Soldatna, but I know now that the indigenous people of this area uh, were the first of, of the area. And I have learned a great deal from Marge, and I respect her tremendously, and it was an honor for me to to be her teacher at this site. Uh, general views again, uh, there was a lot of birch bark uh, lining it. I think the birch bark was from a roof that fell in. Uh, it was hard to tell with the type of excavation we did, but here you see the trowel lifting up a little bit of that birch bark. Um, this is a stepped entryway here which goes down into the house from presumably from the outside of the house and that's been described uh, on sites in the Kuskokwim area on the Yukon, uh, in Yupik territory 
and part of the evidence why I think it's possible that these riverine people were proto-Yupik or Yupik speakers. Here's some more of them, uh, either the wall or the or the or, or the um, timbers from the roof that fell in. Uh, we uh, you know, map all this stuff and get, try to get the pattern. Here's a post mold. This is where a post was in the ground and it would have held up the roof or some kind of structure inside and then uh, over the years decayed and you can see it in the ground and you um, you can map uh, posts from that. We didn't excavate enough of the house to detect a pattern in the posts. There's my shoe. I call this uh, archaeological post mold and archaeologist shoe. So artifacts. Um, the, these are some of the artifacts found, representative sample. Uh, this is slate, arrow points, various sorts of things. Uh, uh, fragments, uh, these are gravers used to score rock. And then these are uh, not stones. Get the whole circle here. So the blue over here uh, indicates the percentage of the sample that were not stones. And I think this is about a thousand artifacts right here. Almost all of them not stones. Lots of not st stones. Not stones are the significant artifact and reflect the use of the area, uh, use of, of, of uh, uh, the fishing that occurred at this particular area. Some other very interesting and surprising finds uh, uh, we uh, we found uh, this birch bark basket. Uh, so this is about a two thousand year old birch bark basket with stones in it, and in within amongst the stones were fish bones. So some of you who are anthropology majors or have interest may know about stone boiling. So the technique is to heat rocks in the hearth and then put the rocks into a water, watertight container full of water and in order to boil water. In this particular case there were fish bones in it so they were making fish soup. Why why they stopped is hard to say. Something interrupted this process. There's a couple of indications, this being one of them, that this was abandoned quickly, uh, this house. Um, uh, so uh, this, is, this is representative of how stone boiling worked. And uh, this, uh, this was just a remarkable find. Uh, this is this, uh, this was exciting, this, uh, exciting to everyone who is part of this. You never know what you're going to find when you excavate a site. This is another interesting find. This is with, within the house. Uh, the, there were two pits. One was empty and the other was full of fish bones. So these are salmon bones, no tails, no heads butchered salmon that were stored in these pits underneath presumably the floorboards of the house uh, for consumption. So these are red salmon or sockeye salmon and that was the targeted fish. Um, this was one means of storage. These could have been and probably were some version of uh, what you pick today people call stink fish or stinky fish, head cheese, fermented fish, uh, which is a kind of preservative and certainly an acquired taste, uh, but you know, our modern Western culture eats a lot of fermented foods. We elevate it to something tasty. Um, but this is a form of preservation, but as far as I can tell, and as far as anyone can tell, the riverine people did not have extensive uh, techniques for preserving salmon. Dried it, certainly. Um, stinky fish, head cheese type 
pits, but it was not until the Denina out at 1000 AD that the techniques of preserving salmon on a large scale were invented. So this would have been a uh, restriction on population size. Salmon come in great numbers, you can't, uh, but if you don't have a way to, to store them for later in the winter, uh, they're not of great use to you. So they intensively fished for salmon, but they did not have an intensive uh, storage system for salmon, other than these stinkfish bits and uh, the standard dried fish. This is the hearth. You recall at the uh, Moose River site, the hearth was the hearth was lined with rocks, and um, here we'll draw it right like this. This is the hearth area, and this uh, presumably would have been the top of the hearth. Um, and why it was not lined with rocks, like the ones at the um, at the Moose River site and other sites, I don't know. Uh, it looked like there was some disturbance. I should finish this off. Here we go. Here. There. Uh, but uh, it was hard to tell. Uh, so I just don't know the answer to that. Uh, it's not typical. And uh, yeah, <laughs> someday somebody will, I hope, answer that question. Um, so this is a stone lamp that was found. And this was uh, another one of those really cool things. So it was upside down. This is the rim. And here is the marks in the sand on this sort of pedestal-like feature within the house where the lamp had been turned over. And here is the moss wick of the lamp as it was put out, as the lights were put out. And here you can still see infused in it the seal oil that was burned in the in the lamp. As we found it, we found it as a sort of a round rock and we weren't sure we were dealing with a lamp. Uh, you don't know that right away, but it was very symmetrical. So the young woman who was excavating this particular pit, we, I took her aside and said, okay, let's practice. I want you to pick it up straight up turn it over and we practiced with a rock of similar size. I didn't want to disturb anything that might be underneath it, you know, out of excitement, which could easily have happened. So we kind of uh, got set. There was a videographer there and uh, she picked it up and immediately you could tell because it was half a half a rock. It was a lamp. She turned it over and there's the image you see now. So to run that back in time, over 2,000 years ago, somebody turned this lamp over, put out the lights. Um, it's, um, it is tradition among Alutig people that lamps should be left turned upside down because lamps have a spirit, lamps have a power, and by turning them over it um, controls uh, the power. It's when they're turned up and lit that the power is released, so to speak. So we respect that tradition. So that lamp is now stored here at Kenai Peninsula College in its own box, turned upside down for some time when it could be displayed for you to see. So back to knot stones. These are a range of sizes of the thousands of knot stones we found at this particular site. They're essentially a pebble with a notch out of one end and a notch out of the other end and uh, were used to uh, hold the net down in the water. I believe drift net fishing being one of the common forms of fishing. So we found this twined spruce root 
net material. It was rather fragmentary. You can see how small it is. There's the tip of a pencil. Um, but it was um, a part of larger nets. In the context of the house, it looked like it had been stored, the nets had been stored on top of the house or in some kind of rafters inside the house, I'm not sure, and it had all fallen in. So we, we salvaged and picked up these bits of spruce root net. So this is the key, salmon, salmon bones, net, fishing, how are they doing it? So this, uh, something like this. So red salmon, or sockeye salmon, in the Kenai River, and as far as I know in all rivers, swim just offshore and near the bottom as they migrate up to spawn. So the net, this would be a model of a net, a spruce root net, would have been uh, drifted on down, uh, catching those salmon, guided by a man in a boat um, with a float on the other end to keep it up in the water, and the, the notch stones tied off every so often in clumps to keep the net near enough the bottom so it catches salmon, but not so deep that the um, net hangs up on the bottom because then you'd lose your net. The, um, the wisdom that would have been required to do this uh, would have been to, uh, uh, to know how much to tie off uh, at the bottom of the net to keep it low so uh, it catches salmon but and not too high so the salmon swim underneath. What I'm getting at is the nature of the flow of the Kenai River varies dramatically through the summer. It spikes with the, with the spring melt and then it drops low and gradually increases in flow with the glacial melt in the Kenai Mountains. And you can detect this uh, almost daily, certainly weekly. So as they were fishing, uh, the, uh, the wisdom would have been to know how many stones to tie off, add to the existing clump of stones to keep the net down in the water. And that's why you find so many stones. No sense untying what's there, retying on a bigger rock. Why not just add a few rocks as need be to keep the net? Uh, I was helped by this uh, uh, with a, a man who uh, from the Kuskokwim area, a Yupik man. And I described the, what I thought was going on here. And he said, oh, yeah, we still do that today. But you have the boat on the wrong side. The boat should be on the inside. Here, we'll, we'll get it over here. The boat should be uh, over here in order to guide it properly. So he said, yeah, I still fish that way today. I, of course, use a metal boat, uh, an aluminum boat, and a skiff and a, and a motor, but a nylon net, but we drift our nets in the, in the Kuskokwim River the same way today. So uh, another little piece of evidence why this uh, is part of a Yupik tradition. Uh, Denina tradition, we'll see, is quite a bit different. So at some point I'll get, I'll get my little drawing out, my computer, and I'll shift this guy over here and move this back over here. But if I were to ask you to draw this, uh, you would put the, the, the man in the boat over here. So here we have it. Um, the, uh, the riverine system. So this is sort of a schematic. So here's the site. Here's where the houses are. So you would drift your net down this way. The salmon are coming up this way, just offshore near the bottom. Drift on down till you have fish take out onshore for processing. Pull your boat back up the river, put it in again with your net, drift it on down, but not taking any more than you need. It's not sport fishing, it's subsistence fishing. Um, and so in this case, a significant limitation being um, that there were no um, 
extensive ways to uh, to uh, store fish that uh, uh, could utilize the entire biomass. This is a set of aerial uh, views of various sites. Uh, I want to establish the point that uh, these sites, these riverine sites, are at the end of a straight stretch of water, a straight stretch of river, because it's very difficult to move a net around a bend or through rocks and rapids. So this one's on the Kasiloff River, and here's that straight stretch of river. And there's the site area. Here's, uh, this is actually the Merrill site. So here we go, straight stretch of river. And that's where the site is, here, before you go around the bend. This is also on the Kasiloff River. Here we go, straight stretch of river. And this is uh, where the site is. Uh, it's off of the air photo here, but you'll have to trust me, this then makes a big bend around like so right there. And here's another one. This is on the Kenai River. So here's, uh, I'm not sure where it would start here, probably here, straight stretch of river. And there's the site here. There's also one right across the river here, just before you get to the bend. So drift net fishing, spruce root drift net fishing for sockeye salmon in the Kenai River, riverine Kachemak tradition. Uh, this is a little graph I did uh, with uh, plotting some of the sites in terms of the slope of the river. So in other words, these spikes here are uh, rapids. This is the Naptown Rapids here, and I don't know what the rapids that is there, but these are different rapids fast flowing areas of the river. So this is the slope in feet per foot. So the lower it is on the graph, the more it would be uh, quiet water. And so here I've plotted in river miles some of the sites that are riverine uh, Kachemak sites, and they're all in the quiet water area. Again, another piece of evidence to suggest that they're drift net fishing in the river, because you want to do that in quiet water. So, Yupik or Sugpiak, a um, uh, riverine Kachemak tradition has a uh, river salmon focus, um, uh, drift fishing, lamps, stepped entryways, all of these things point uh, largely to the Kuskokwim River area, Yupik area. So, I think you could, you can make the case that the riverine people were a proto-Yupik or related to Yupik-speaking peoples, um, whereas the marine Kachemak tradition has that marine mammal focus, harpoons, lamps, larger houses. Um, these were uh, probably related to the Alutic or Sugpiak peoples um, who subsequently occupied the area. And last slide, this sort of sets the stage. So this is what we've been talking about. Here's the drift net. Here's the houses. These are the salmon, targeting red salmon. The Denina, as we'll see in the, or hear about in the next lecture, uh, targeted uh, early run kings and the late run silver or coho salmon who spawn up creeks like the tributary creek of Slycock Creek which is right by the college. So we will make the case that they developed a different style of fishing. And the reason they targeted particularly the late run uh, coho or silver salmon is they wanted to minimize the time between when they caught the fish and when they put them in a complex underground cache pit or cold storage pit. And that was a preservative maximizing use of salmon and changing the ecological picture for the Denina. So that story we'll pick up in the next lecture and uh, thank you very much.